we're gonna get started i'm pretty sure still some people heading a bit late but it's fine um but basically we're going over you cycle the february contest and we're going to go over some tips and tricks because somebody requested it and um first off the february contest ended like yesterday in the morning oh, um but the results are not posted so basically what that means is a um, we can't like check the cutoff scores, so you don't know if you've made it or not. And also B, the solutions that I'm going to be showing, I cannot guarantee if they worked or not because I couldn't check it like against the grader. Um, I think they work, but there might be bugs. So if you like any of you guys see something that might be a bug, you can let me know because there is a chance it might be. But otherwise, we'll just get started. Um, first, we'll go over the past contest, then we'll go over some resources and tips. And if we have time, I think um, Josh will go over the past silver contest. Uh, so the past February contest. Also, by the way, the next contest is going to be from April 2nd to 5th. It's the US Open. Um, basically, the only difference is that it's probably going to be a bit harder in difficulty, but the cutoff score might be lower because it's harder in difficulty. And it's also the last contest of the month. Or of the season. So like the next one will be in December again. So it's like problem number one. Um, it's called Year of the Cow. Um, I'll quickly go over it. So basically it says Farmer John's cows are excited to learn that Chinese New Year was recently celebrated. Um, ushering in the Year of the Ox, always a bovine favorite. As we know, the zodiac animals for Chinese calendar years follow a 12 year cycle, blah, blah, blah. And it says Bessie the cow is proud to say she was born in a Year of the Ox many years ago. Um, her friend Elsie wants to know how many years apart from Bessie she was born and hopes you can help her deduce this by looking at relationships between the birth years of several cows on the farm. And it gives the input format. Basically, N is a variable integer and it gives the next N lines contain eight word phrases specifying the relationship between the birth years of two cows. So it's the form of Mildred born in previous dragon year from Bessie or Mildred born in next dragon year from Bessie. And then it goes on and says like the first word is the name of the cow on the farm. Um, the first word, right, is not Bessie. So basically the first word is the name of a cow on the farm who is not Bessie and who has not yet been mentioned in the input. And then um, the last word is a name of the cow on the farm, which is either Bessie or a cow that has already been mentioned in a previous line of input. And that line is pretty important because basically what it tells us that um, uh, basically, what it tells us is the last cow is always going to have already been previously given to us. So, like, for example, this first line is always going to have, like, Bessie at the end. Then the next line can have, like, two options, right, Bessie or whoever was above that, which makes, like, it a lot easier for us. I'll explain later. And then, right, the fifth word is the 12 zodiac animals. And then um, the fourth word is either previous or next to signify. And then, so this is a sample input. Mildred born in previous dragon year from Bessie, Greta born in previous monkey year from Mildred, and then Elsie 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 was born in next ox year from Greta, and then Paulina was born in next dog year from Bessie, and it outputs 12 um, because Elsie was born 12 years before Bessie, and you can deduce that because Greta was born 17 years before Bessie, and you can deduce that by um, because Mildred was born nine years before Bessie. And then Paulina doesn't actually matter because we aren't, she doesn't like, it, we're only looking for LCs, right? So we don't really care how many years Paulina was born because she's not in the chain from LC to Greta to Mildred to Bessie. Uh, so look over the code. I code everything in Java because I like Java best. Um, basically, uh, I'm sure there's another solution, one that's probably better, but I created three hash maps. So we'll start with this hash map here. This one's... Um, it's just like a dictionary. It's called Zodiac. All it contains is um, the Zodiac animal and then the year. So ox is zero, and then it goes on like in order, the proper order. And so we never modify this scene at all. We just use this to you know convert like the Zodiac animal into a year number so we can subtract and add and do all that stuff. And then the Zodiac, uh, the hash map that's called a cow, um, this stores each, each cow name that's given to us and how many years before or after uh, they were born versus Bessie. So Bessie is the first one in there and is zero, right? Cause it's Bessie. The next cow might be like uh, Mildred or something who was born 
and then it would have like an X next to it instead of zero because X stands for you know how many years they were born before Bessie. And then all we need to do at the very end is get um, LC's key, right? And see how many, whatever the integer is corresponding with LC and that's our answer. And then Cal Zodiac, um, that just corresponds to Cal to the Zodiac sign. So Bessie is an ox, blank is a blank, right? Blah, blah, blah. And it just keeps on going. And then so, um, I created a scanner for simplicity. Um, N is the integer parsing it next line. And then we have a for loop going from one to N plus one. Um, we could actually just go from zero to N. I'm not sure why I did N one plus to N plus one actually. And then for the next lines of input, um, we can create a string array called line and we do in dot next line dot split space. So what that does is it, it grabs the next line, right? Cause in dot next line grabs the next line. And then dot split space, what it does is it splits the line into an array um, by whatever character. And the character we're giving it is a space sign. So what happens is um, if you know, you're given the sign of input, it splits it all into spaces. So your array would be Mildred would be a string in the array. Born would be a string in the array. In would be a string in the array, previous array, and so on. And you'd end up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, strings in that array. And then because it's all static, we know line of zero, right? The first element is always going to be the Cal one name. Line of three, which is the fourth element will be previous or next, whichever one. Line of four, the fifth element will be the zodiac sign. And then the last one, line of seven, the eighth element will be the second Cal name. And then this is just debug, right? We'll just print out the string that whatever it was, you know, just to show us. Uh, when we were turning this in, we would probably just comment it out. And then we also put it into the cow zodiac. So this is a cow zodiac, remember? So we'll put in the corresponding cow, right? Line of zero. And then line of four, whichever zodiac animal they line up to. And then we um, have one if statement. It checks whether it is previous or next year. Um, if it's a previous year, this is just debug. Um, but if it's a previous year, we use this little formula here. What it does is we do 12 minus zodiac dot get of line four plus zodiac dot get of cow zodiac dot get of line seven plus cow dot get of line seven. Um, so to simplify this, um, zodiac dot get of line four, what that is, is we are grabbing whatever line four value is, right? The zodiac sign. So we are grabbing the number corresponding to whatever animal it is. Um, is the number according to whatever animal it is. And then, so that's just the number. So if it was ox, it would give us seven. And then zodiac dot get of cow zodiac dot get of line seven. What that is, is um, the cow two zodiac in number form. So cow zodiac dot get of line seven, that gives us um, the corresponding zodiac animal to whichever cow name we put. So if our input line was milk, uh, let's just say Mildred born in previous dragon year from Bessie, right? So it would give us, it would grab Bessie's um, zodiac animal from the hash map, which is an ox. And then it would grab the number from the zodiac hash map of ox, which is zero. And then the last one is cal.get of line seven. So that is the number of years cal two was born before Bessie because um, it's like a sequential chain, right? So like if cal A was born five years before cal B and cal B was born five years before Bessie, Cal A was born 10 years before Bessie. So we want to, you know, add that whatever, how many years this cow was born before. And so it's a 12 minus. Um, it'll make more sense when we print it all out. And then we put it into the cow array. So we give the cow name and then however many years they were born before Bessie. And um, this is if uh, line three is next. And it's the same concept. All of these variables are the same, except it's a bit different here. We're just doing a plus sign and a subtract and subtract. Um, so I can explain this a bit more. So basically when I find the number of years, all right, so if cow one was a tiger and cow two was a snake, right? So one and four, and then assuming cow one was born uh, the previous year before cow two, right? So then um, you would want to do 12 minus one plus four, simply because um, we want to count backwards from tiger to snake. How many years does it take tiger to reach snake? Uh, I don't know if that's the best explanation. Here, I'm just going to run the code and we can print it out and we can see what it shows. So I have my console here. 
Uh, this is unfortunate. I have to manually type this in, but it's okay. Oh, that's just fine. So um, after the first line of input, this is a line, right? The array that we had, and it shows 300. Zero, zero. Um, 300 zero, zero corresponds to these numbers, right? So 0 to 12 of uh, the dragon year is um, the third one, and then the ox is 0, right? Because that's uh, Bessie's year. And then um, number of years Bessie was before in Bessie is obviously also 0. And then we can type the next line. So Greta was born in previous monkey year from Mildred. And it gives the same thing. Um, I'm not going to explain it this time. Okay, yeah, and at the very end, it gives us the output, which is 12. And uh, yeah, um, I can draw a number line to show how it works. Yeah, we can do that. Um, but I think I'm just going to move on from the question for now. Hopefully, if you guys don't understand the statement, um, let me know and I can come back to it. But I'm not sure how we're doing on time. And I want to make sure you finish all the questions first. But if you like don't understand how this statement here works, let me know and I'll, I can explain it. Um, but we're going to look at comfortable cows. Um, that's the second one. Um, so we're going to skim the question. So there's a farmer John has a pasture and it's a 2D grid of square cells. So it's like a chessboard. And then um, he has N, which is 10 to the 5 amount of cows in a one by one, right? Because chessboard. And then the cells they occupy is distinct and it's from zero to a thousand. So zero to a thousand is not that big. So that's good news. And then a cow is said to be comfortable if it is horizontally or vertically adjacent to exactly three other cows. And then so um, that's important. And a farmer, John, is interested in counting the comfortable cows on his farm for each I in each, the range of one to N. I'll put the total number of comfortable cows after the I cow is added to the pasture. So then it gives the input format, which already told us. So 801, all of this stuff, what it is, is um, you have eight points, eight cows, right? So the first cow is at zero, 01. And you output zero because there are no comfortable cows, right? There's a cow one zero, you still output zero, there's no comfortable cows. One one, there's no comfortable cows. But then at one two, you have one comfortable cow. And um, so we can go to Desmos and graph this. Basically, um, the reason why it's comfortable is because it has three horizontally, horizontal or vertically adjacent um, points next to it. So zero one one zero one one what was it? Uh, zero one one zero one 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 two. Okay, yeah. So one two. And so, um, after these points are added, there's one um comfortable cow. This cow here at one one is comfortable because right S three horizontal S three adjacent cows right. Yes, two vertical and one horizontal. And then um the next one is two one. And it goes back to zero. And the reason why it goes back to zero is because um, after you add this cow here, the cow one one is no longer comfortable, right? Because now it has four adjacent friends instead of three. So it goes from comfortable to uncomfortable. And then it keeps on adding. Um, I'll just plot out all of this real quick. So it gives two, two. Um, it also gives three, one, and then three, two. Okay, so, and then when you get to three, one, so when you get to three one, which is this cow, um, you have one comfortable cow, which is cow here. Cow at point at two one would be comfortable because it has these three friends. And then when you add the cow, the last one at three two, um, this cow here at two two is also going to be comfortable because now it also has three friends, right? So that's why the input at the end is one and two. Um, so this one to start off, we create a, a 2D array, a matrix of 1003 to 1003, I'll explain that later. This stores the cow's neighbors. Then we create another Boolean 2D array, 1003, 1003, stores if the cow exists or not. Um, we can hard code in an array of this size because a thousand is not that bad. And in public static answer equals zero, that's how many comfortable cows we have. So AKA number of comfortable cows. 
We also have a scanner for simplicity. We grab n, then we loop through from zero to n. And then um, we grab the two coordinates, x and y. And then we want to add one to each of them because we do not want to deal with negative checks. The reason why we don't want to deal with negative checks is so um, if you had a cow at this point here, right, on one zero, and you wanted to check its neighbors, you would need to check like the cow here, like a negative one, negative one, or negative, wait, cow one, negative one. And our array doesn't store negative values. So we're just going to shift everything up and to the right by one. So it starts from one, one and goes all the way to a thousand and one, I think. Right. And then, so that's the reason why we have it a thousand three to give us a buffer if we're checking to the right of a thousand and two or something. And that way we won't have to worry about like negative values and like array index out of bounds. Um, and then we mark the cow as true in cow of X or Y, this is right, it's a Boolean one. And then we check. So if already um, this cow has three neighbors, let's increment answer and increment um, the number of comfortable cows. Then we wanna update each of its neighbors, right? It has four neighbors, um, X minus one, X plus one, X, Y minus one, X, Y plus one, right? That should make sense, right? And then after you update the neighbors, we print out answer. Um, so when you update a neighbor, it takes in two values, two parameters, X and Y. And then the first thing it does is it increments um, mat of X and Y, right? Which stores our table values. Um, the reason why it increments those because it had a new neighbor, right? Like if I add a cow one, one, and I um, update one, zero, I should increment one, zero by one because it got a new neighbor in one, one. And then we check if that cow, uh, if the cow exists, exi uh, sorry, if the cow exists first, right? Because a cow cannot be uncomfortable or comfortable if it doesn't exist, right? You, um, it's possible at this point might have three neighbors, but if there's no cow there, it doesn't matter because we don't care about it. So that's why we want to first check that it, um, it is there. And then after that, we want to check if it is comfortable or not, right? So if it's equal to three, it has three neighbors, we're going to increment answer. And then we also want to check if it's greater than three, because if it's greater than three, what that meant was it had three cows before we incremented, but now that we incremented, it has more than three. So we want to subtract one because it used to be comfortable, but it's now uncomfortable. And um, we are sure that this thing here will only run once because um, basically we're sure this thing will only run once because a mat of X and Y will never be greater than four because there's no possibility you have more than four neighbors because we're only checking up, down, left, right. And so that should work. And the reason why um, it's very simple is because each time you're adding on a new point onto the, the points we originally already had, so we only need to check like one extra point and it's four neighbors. Uh, so if we run this one, oh shoot, I need to manually input again. That's unfortunate, but we put in eight, uh, zero, one, zero, that's correct. One, zero, one, 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 two, two, one, two, two, three, one, three, two. And yeah, so it does come out correct. I mean, I don't know if it works in the actual program, but like against the actual grader, but for now it does. And so now we're gonna look at the last one from the bronze contest, which was clockwise fence. Um, basically summarize all of this down. You're given an input statement, you're given a number, and then you're given two strings um, or however many strings this number, right? So if this was three, you would be given three strings. The string uh, varies length from four to a hundred characters, I believe. I believe it said that somewhere. Yeah, four to a hundred. And then um, it only contains four options per character, N, E, S, or W, right? North, East, Southwest, those are directions. And then um, it symbolizes the direction that a cow is traveling. And then um, each like N, E, S, or W symbolizes a one meter run in that direction of this fence that Farmer John is laying down. And then the fence ends at the position where it started, right? Because like it's a proper fence that encloses an area. So um, it's always going to end at the point it started. And then it's never going to cross over that point more than once. So when it hits that point again, it's going to be the very last, uh, it's going to be the very last direction, basically. Um, it's, here is two um, uh, symbolizations. So at is the starting point. Um, and you can see N, right? So it goes up by one carat, right? One meter goes east, it goes right, then it goes south, then it goes west. 
and it reaches back here. And then um, for each of these test cases, it wants you to print out CW or CCW. CW stands for clockwise, CCW stands for counterclockwise, right? So it wants to print out if um, the fence is going clockwise or counterclockwise. And you can see this one, it's another symbolization for all of this thing here. It's kind of confusing, but it goes west down, south, 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 east, east, north, west again, north, East, east, south, south, east, north, 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 west, 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 and then south, and it reaches here, right? So this one is obviously going clockwise, right? It's going to the right. And this one is ultimately going to the left, counterclockwise. And so how we can do this problem, um, there's actually a number of methods, actually, I figured out. Um, the way this one is coded up is we're gonna check the number of turns going clockwise. So I'll explain it. So we create a sc um, scanner, we grab n, we loop through for n, right? And then um, we create a char array of all of the characters it gives us. So in that next line gives us the next line, right? So it might be NESW, right? Which our next line. And then we convert it to a char array. So every, on um, that string, every single character is an element in this array. And then we store the number of turns. I'll get to this later. And then for in j equals one, all the way to the length of the array, uh, we do a check. So what we check first is if we check char array of j is not equal to char array of j minus one. So we check if this index, this element is not equal to the element behind. And then after that, we check if is cw, which is a function down here, um, of the previous element and the current element is true. And if it is, we increment turns. If it isn't, we decrement turns. And after all of that, we have a ternary operator. I wanna practice it. But basically we check if turns was greater than zero, then it, would be count, then it would be clockwise. And if it's less than zero or less than or equal to zero, which shouldn't ever happen, it should never be equal to zero because then it wouldn't be a full um, loop, I believe. Um, then it would be counterclockwise. And then we print out answer and we do it for the next one. So basically what turns is keeping track of is it keeping track of um, how many clockwise turns you're going. So basically, um, is CW, it takes in the first char and the second char, and it checks if a pair of chars, right, first and second, are north, then east, east and south, south and west, or west and north, right? If there are any of these combinations, it would be going clockwise, and we return true. And if it's not any of these combinations, it would be going counterclockwise, and return false. Um, the reason why that works is, right, if you think about it, if you go in the direction of north, then east, you're going up, then right, which is going towards the right. And if you go to the right, then down, that's also going to the right. And if you're going down, then left, that's also going towards the right. And if you're going to the left, then up, that's also ultimately going to the right. So um, we just check it in pairs like that. So right, if this turns out to be true, um, we give we increment turns. And if it isn't true, right, for that one, we decrement turns. The reason why we have this if statement here, checking that it's not equal to previous is because if it's like north and north, right, they're identical, we don't care because ultimately you're still going in the same direction. You're not going counterclockwise or clockwise at all. So we don't worry about it. We only want it if it's two different pairs or two different um, characters. So we can run this one. Um, this one's going to be a pain to type in. Okay, well, two N E S W and it turns clockwise, which is true. Oh, I accidentally hit enter, my bad. The two, um, N-E-S-W, and then W-S-S-S-E-E, -E and W-W, wait, N-W-N-E-E-S-S-E-E, and W-W-W-S, and it's counterclockwise. So yeah, it does work. And then um, really quickly, last thing is also, there's actually another method to do this. Um, I didn't think of it, but I heard that you could um, check the farthest most point when it's at the, um, you can check the position of the fence at the farthest most to the right or to the east, and then check if it's going up or down. And if it's going up in that way, right, it would be going counterclockwise. And if it's going down at that time, it would be going clockwise. And I think it does work, though I didn't code it up and nor did I check it. But it's thought processes, right? You you just check at the farthest most point, it's going right. And if it's going up, right, that means you know 
is the first most point going right. So if it goes up, then it must be going right and up, which means it's going left counterclockwise. And then if it's the opposite, right, it's going down at that point, right? So here, first most point that's going down, that would be clockwise. And it uses the same theory as we do here, right? It because right, if you're at the farthest most point right and you're going down, that's equivalent to east and south, right, over here. And that would be clockwise. And I'm pretty sure that does work, but I did not code it up. And then, so that's it for the past contest. Um, hopefully those work and those make sense. When the results are out, um, I'll submit everything to a creator and any issues or bugs, I'll let you guys know. But right now we're gonna quickly go over um, some tips and resources. And if Senkai or Josh, you guys have other resources too. Um, oh yeah, and also Devin did mention the shoelace formula. I wasn't gonna bring this up, but you can do that. So you turn it into a coordinate plane and it use a shoelace formula with, um, without the absolute value. All right, so really quickly, cause this is pretty cool. I don't know how many of you guys know the shoelace formula. It's like using very rare math. Uh, yeah, we can look at this one. But basically you're given a coordinate plane, right? X1, X, X1, Y1, X2, Y2. And you multiply diagonally like this, and then you add it up. And it gives you like the area, right? In absolute value. But we don't need the area. Instead, all we need is um, if it's positive or negative. If it's positive, I think it goes clockwise, I think. And if it's negative, it's like counterclockwise, I forgot. Um, but here's a stack overflow showing um, how to determine if a list of polygon points are in clockwise order, right? So it gives you the coordinates and then all you need to do is you can use like the shoelace theorem, right? And check, and if it's negative, it's counterclockwise. If it's positive, it is clockwise. So yeah, I mean, if you knew that, good for you because that probably would have been a good way to do it. Anyway, so now we're gonna go into learning resources. So, um, the cycle guide is the newest resource out and it's also like the hottest resource. It's very commonly referenced. Um, it's nice because it's curated and created by a group of like students who have like went to like the IOI who are like really good. Uh, and they have nice sections. They have general, bronze, silver, gold, plat, and advanced. Um, I would recommend going through like general, bronze, and silver at least. They um, go by topic to topic. So like, um, it goes by like different um, theories that might you might see on the U-cycle problems. And then the U-cycle training gateway is also pretty good, although it is a bit outdated. Um, reasons why it's outdated is because one, it's outdated. And also two, um, the difficulty is kind of interesting. Like if I remember correctly, like the third problem you do is like beads and it's like a gold level problem I heard. And also the downfall is you cannot like skip problems. You have to go in order and you have to like get it correct before you can move on to the next one. So I, could, I recommend Googling the solution once you like spend like 20 minutes on it because you don't want to spend like a year stuck on it. Um, personally, when I did it in Java, this guy named Johan Ronk, he has like a lot of the solutions and his own analysis on his own code, which was kind of helpful. Um, I'm sure there are other resources for like C++ in different languages. There's a Usacle unofficial Discord. It's not bad. Geeks for Geeks is it's pretty good. Um, I'm sure you guys know what that is. CP Handbook. I've never personally used it, but I also heard it's pretty good. And in Bronze and Silver Usacle books by Darren Yao. Um, Darren Yao is like, I think he was also an IOI competitor, but he wrote two um, introduction Usacle books in Java and C++. Not in Java and C++, but for Java and C++. And in practice resources, um, Usacle guide does have a lot of problems. So if you go to the problems tab, it has them all sorted by different topics. But if you also go by sections, right? Um, at the very bottom, it also has a list of problems per section, which is very useful, right? Because you wanna practice what you just learned. And then old contest problems, that's always very useful. And then Usacle Training Gateway, right? They have a lot of problems. Code Forces, that's also a um, competitive like programming website. Um, it has a lot of rounds. Um, you can learn more about it, go to their page. And in CSCS, that's a problem set. It has a lot of classic um, algorithm problems. Um, there are no solutions given. Um, you could probably Google the solutions, but just note like there's nowhere you can go like, hey, I want to see the answer for these. And also, yeah, those are resources for practice. And then um, general tips. So 
it's important to choose a good language. C++ is probably the best choice because of its speed. Java is not bad, it's doable. Um, most people only choose Java or C++. Python, it's not recommended because it's too slow after bronze. You could probably go through bronze um, well with Python, but after that, you might start running to timeout issues where your algorithm is accurate, but it just takes too long to run because Python's kind of slow. And the servers do not run PyPy, they just use Python. So Python is like, be careful if you're using this. Make sure you read solutions. Um, the reason why I don't want to spend too much time practicing like just pure coding is because it takes a lot of time each problem and you probably don't have like two, three hours a chunk, right, to work on a problem, especially if you're lost or you're stuck. So it's well recommended to like, you know, after 20, 30 minutes, depending on difficulty, after you've thought and tried out everything, um, to just read the solution. And then after read the solution, make sure you A, understand the solution and then B, you're able to, you know, code it up later if the problem was given to you in a contest. And then also always remember the brute force and don't overthink, especially with bronze. And then practice writing your templates. That's optional. So um, they banned templates this year. So you cannot like have a template. However, you're, allowed to, you're allowed to um code up your template, right? So if you're like really familiar with it, your template and you can code up in like a minute, it's recommended you just code it up by hand and then just continue on. Um, a good template, what it would do for you is it would automatically have input and output like ready. It would have debug ready too. Um, templates like for like algorithms, I think they're allowed, but I don't think anyone uses that because it's kind of sketch. But um, because most of the time the problem isn't just like applying one single algorithm. But yeah, practice writing your template. If you want like a Java one, you can check out Catio, I think it's called K-A-T-T-I-O. I think that's a decent one or you can create your own. And then um, in contest tips. So first you wanna read all three problems. You only have four hours. So like it matters um, how many problems you get. And it doesn't matter like which problem you get. It just matters how many points you end up at the end. Um, it's also important you know how the contest scores work. Um, we don't have this on the slide, but basically if there are 20 test cases and you get 10 out of 20, um, you got 500 points. Um, so it's a total amount of test cases in all three problems combined. And then that's your denominator and your numerator is the total amount of test cases you got correct out of all three problems. So if problem one had 10 test cases and you got nine out of 10, problem two had 15 and you got like 10 out of 15, and problem three had like 20 and you got like one out of 20, you probably got a kind of low score. It's not good. Um, so it's recommended always do the easiest one first and um, make sure you first know a solution. So if you see a problem, you think you know the solution, first make sure it works properly. Like think it out, think it through. Um, check the edge cases, right? So like edge cases are referred to like um, basically cases where like it's the problem set, the problem setter, setter intentionally designed this like scenario to be an edge case where it's not likely to happen. Um, however, it's meant to like break your algorithm. So it might be something uh, like a, a very basic example is like if you're looping through an array an edge case might be like at the very end of the array where like um, you might get like an index out of bounds exception for some reason, but like make sure you check your edge cases and then consider the difficulty to debug and consider how long it would take you to code, right? You want a program that is easy to debug and easy to code and easy to read because time is of the essence. So, and also if you can brute force, just brute force it because it's gonna be easier, it's gonna take less time and it'll be easier for you to debug. And if the question doesn't have an obvious solution, um, don't just start coding, spend some more time thinking about it and try to come up with a solution. Most people spend like, uh, more time thinking than coding in the actual cycle contest. The goal is for you to think of an algorithm that works and then spend minimal time coding it up. Um, and so for bronze, if you're really stuck, try to brute force. And if you're in silver and plus, and you're really stuck, uh, try to look for patterns and look for clues and generally don't brute force because uh, it most likely isn't going to work because of time. Um, silver and up problems, most likely you're gonna run into a time exception because it's designed so you're not allowed to brute force it. And so now we, um, we're we not gonna go over the past silver contest because it's 110 and we're out of time. So um, we'll see you guys next week.
if you guys have questions, you can let us know. If for some reason you really want to see the silver solutions, uh, you could probably message Josh because I think he has most of it. All right, I'm going to assume you guys don't have questions. If you do, you can just message us. Otherwise, I'm going to end the meeting for everybody.